Lord, teach us to pray, just as John also taught his disciples to pray. That is from Luke 11.1, 1, and that is one of the most profound requests that the disciples of Jesus ever asked him. In today's video, I'm going to be sharing with you how to pray, and we'll be reading from Matthew 6, 7 to 15, and we'll basically dissect this prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Now let's read. And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. So do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then in this way. I'm ending here at verse 9. Verse 9 says, pray then in this way. This prayer that is about to come is clearly stated here by Jesus to be a pattern. It says, pray in this way, pray in this manner. Jesus is not saying that we need to memorize this prayer and then say to ourselves every morning and every evening before we go to bed. And that is our idea of a prayer life with God. If that were the case, then we'll be doing what Jesus just condemned in verse 7, which he says that the pagans, the Gentiles, were using meaningless repetition. It says, and when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition. Jesus just condemned it in verse 7. And then he goes down in verse 8 also to continue to show us how we should not be like the Gentiles and pray like that. And then in verse 9, he says, here is the pattern. This pattern is meant to be an example, a sample for us to look at. And then we pray in a similar fashion. So the call here by Jesus is not to do what many of us have done in our churches, where this prayer has become a prayer that we memorize and then have people pray it from memory and then that is a, their way of praying. That is not Jesus' idea here. And I'm not saying that this prayer is not good for memorization. It is very important to memorize because that's how you get to use it as a pattern. Or as a way to then model your own prayers after it. So let's look at the rest of the verses. And we're going to actually look at the prayer in detail now from verse 9 down. And I've broken it down here into portions that I think are important for us to, to look at. Jesus says, Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also forgive those who are our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, he starts with our Father. Why is this important? Why does Jesus begin a prayer like this? And he says we should start by going to God with that sort of opening. Our Father. This establishes a relationship. See, we go to God based on a relationship that we have with God. And that is the grounds that we stand on for God to answer our prayer. So speaking out this relationship, calling God our Father, gives us a right, so to speak, to be able to go to Him with boldness, to approach the throne of grace with boldness so as to receive grace and mercy from God. It is based on this relationship that Jesus died to establish for us. So it is important for us to have that mindset that God is our Father and we approach Him as our Father. He follows who is in heaven. This establishes God's sovereignty. And I'll explain what I mean by that. 
See, God is our Father, and the Bible is clear about that. But God is also a lofty and highly lifted God. God is a God who is in heaven. Heaven is high above the earth. And the Bible says as the heavens are higher than the earth, God's wisdom is higher than our wisdom. God's greatness is higher than our greatness. So while we approach God based on our relationship that we have with him as our father, we need to never forget that God is still a lofty God, is still a mighty and holy and powerful God. He's the same God that created the universe. He's the same God that controls all the subatomic particles and holds them together. And he holds everything together. He causes the sun to move in its path. Or the, the solar system to move around the sun in their paths. He causes the planets to move. Everything that is has been created by God. We need to remember that. That God, even though he's our father, he is not a God that just lives with us, that is in the sense that he's another human being. No, no, no. We need to approach God as Father, but also revere him and see him as sovereign. Then he goes, hallowed be your name. Hallowed, the word hallowed here means holy. This word means holy. So we need to see God as holy. And we need to declare God's holiness. This is an adoration. The Bible says that our righteousness is as a filthy rack to God. We need to still see God as unique and set apart from us. That God is perfect and God cannot behold unrighteousness. When we declare God's holiness, why is that important to us? It reminds us that God does not behold sin. It reminds us that we need to live holy lives, holy and righteous lives, because the scriptures are clear that the prayer of a righteous man avails much. We have power in prayer when we live lives that glorify God. Not that our holiness is what opens the door. No, the blood of Jesus does everything. We have a righteous standing before God because of the blood of Jesus and everything we receive from God we receive because of that position we have in Christ. But our lives matter. And this helps us to be able to remember that. The next phrase says, Your kingdom come. Now, if you see in here, I've underlined several instances of your. Your, I, I, you see it here. And you see it here, and you see it here, and what are, and also here. All over this prayer, it is about your God, about God, about God. See, prayer is not about us. Prayer is about God. It should be God-centered, not us-centered. There are references about us in here because they are necessary because we have to refer to ourselves as we talk to Him. But this prayer is all about God. If you look at it, it's all about God. It's all about God's will. It's all about God's purposes. It's all about God, His kingdom, His power, His glory. It's all about Him. So our prayers when we go to God, even though we know that we have needs, we have petitions and supplications that we want to make, we need to be careful to make sure that our prayers are God-centered, that we go to God in prayer seeking God. We, sh we are seeking God's heart in prayer. We're not only seeking His hand. When we focus on God's heart, we are going to get God's hand too. But when we focus on God's hand and focus on our needs, we miss the big picture. So, now, let's look at your kingdom come. This teaches us that we need to seek God's purposes in the world. Seek God's purposes. God's purposes in the world. This is important. Our prayer lives should not be about us. See, God has 
purposes in this world right now, such as winning the world to Christ, bringing men to salvation. God has people, tribes all over the world that have never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. See, God is a missionary God. God has purposes in this world. We need to welcome those purposes. And one of, the God's, one of God's purposes is that His kingdom come on earth. And so we welcome this purpose. Remember that Jesus is giving us a pattern. So we see here, we say, what does God mean by your kingdom come? What does he mean here when he writes in his book, the scriptures, your kingdom come? He is saying we should welcome and seek the purposes of God in the world. And one of God's purposes is for his kingdom to come. And, and his kingdom comes when people are led to Christ, when Christ becomes God in their life. That's how God's kingdom comes. That's very important. The next phrase we look at is your will be done on earth as it is in heaven this is a very powerful one when we approach God in prayer we need to have our own wills completely I mean completely surrendered to him that is called brokenness where we are ready to obey God as soon as we understand what he's trying to say without such submission we cannot hear God and without such submission, our hearts are rebellious to God. See, if a Christian does not actively seek the will of God and pursue it, then he's pursuing his own will. There is no other way. If you don't actively seek the will of God and pursue it, you automatically seek your own will. And if you seek a will other than the will of God, you live in rebellion. So this is very important. When we approach God, it should be, Your will be done. Father, your will be done on earth. It should be, Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It should always be about God's will, not our will. We humans are very, very self-centered. And the sin that we have, that one of our greatest sins, that we have as human beings is that self-centeredness, that focus on ourselves and that pride that needs to be broken when we totally surrender our self-will to God and have God crush that self-will so that we have no self-will and all we have is the will of God. This is very important and let's look at some verses from the book of James and from the book of Luke about the importance of us surrendering our will and see God's example, Jesus' example. When I use God, sometimes I'm referring to Jesus as in this instance. So James says, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, to one who knows the right thing, to do and does not do it to him it is sin James touches a point here that many of us Christians usually forget we make plans without involving God we pursue our own wills without pursuing the will of God and this is complete rebellion the call of the Christian life is a call to slavery, in quotes. We are sons of God. But as far as the will is concerned, we are to be like Jesus. Jesus, when he walked on earth, he was the perfect example for us to follow. When he walked on earth, he was a slave of God. He had no will of his own. Jesus did only what he saw God doing. And he spoke 
only what he heard God speaking. That is a perfect example of a slave. He had no thoughts of his own. In fact, Jesus said, I do not judge. I only give the judgment that God gives. Jesus was completely 100% submitted to God. And it was not because Jesus was God that he was able to do that. Jesus relied on the Holy Spirit just like we have to rely on him, the Holy Spirit, for our daily walk. Let's listen to what Jesus said here. Father, if you are willing to take this cup from me, or rather, Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. This is in the throes of Jesus' crucifixion, when Jesus is, is, is being taken over to be crucified and is praying to the point where his sweat is like drops of blood. And Jesus is saying this. Jesus is about to face the toughest thing in his entire mission. And he prays that if you are willing, God's will, he's seeking God's will here, take this cup from me. Jesus is appealing that if God is willing, he should take this cup from him. Yet not my will, but your will be done. And the call of uh, the Christian is to say every day in his life, Lord, this morning, not my will, but your will be done. Lord, this afternoon, not my will, but your will be done. And you make plans only based on God's will. This is very important. And our prayers also must reflect that. This is also crucial. And one thing that I have come to understand is that God only answers prayers that are according to his will. This is very important to remember. God only answers prayers that are according to his will. That is why the Holy Spirit is very important in prayer. As I will get you to see in future videos that we're going to do. Without the Holy Spirit it is impossible to pray a prayer that can be answered. Because the scriptures say only a man's spirit knows what is in a man. And so the Spirit of God searches the heart of God. And knows what is in the heart of God. And the Spirit of God helps us to pray when we are weak and we do not know what to pray. He intercedes for us with groans that are not utterable, with groans that words cannot express. So this is very important. The next thing that I want us to look at is, so let me put here, so your will, we need to surrender our wills to God completely. And then the next step is we need to ask for our daily bread. And remember it says daily here. And that is important. So we need to ask God for provision to give us what we need, our daily bread. And we must ask what we need to be given to us according to God's will. Everything we do, we should breathe according to God's will. We should go to school. According to God's will, we should do everything that we do as a Christian. According to God's will, we should buy our cars. According to God's will, we should everything. Our lives should be aligned around God's will. Even our daily bread. There is a temptation that we have living in a very affluent society like the one we do in in the United States and Europe where we have the richest Christian group the richest Christian community in the history of Christendom. Never has there been in the history of Christianity a group of Christians as affluent as we are. Many sources say that just with 1% of the Christian income in the United States in just one year, Just 1% of it can help take care of all the 1 billion people in this world that are living way under poverty. Can you imagine that? So, in such a community as ours, where affluence is common, where every one of us, if you make 
over twenty four thousand a year as a family. You are one of the richest people in the world. You are like ninety nine percent, you know, up there. You're everybody else is 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 pretty much poorer than you. Even though we frequently like to look at the next door neighbor, look at the Joneses, and see how we are worse off than them, and then we feel very sad and complain to God about how we are poor. But if we look at the rest of the world and really look at the picture that God looks, God will say, son, daughter, you are richer than 99% of the people in the world. And I made all of them and I love them too. And you complain? So uh, what am I saying about this point with daily bread? We need to seek to receive from God our daily bread like God promises here, like God is asking us to pray here. And Jesus lived it out. So did the apostles. The idea is, it is very easy for for money that you've saved up for your retirement 30 years in advance. So much so that you have no need financially. You have all your bills paid. You, in fact, have insurance that covers everything. You really don't need God in a way. You don't depend on Him because you have it figured out. So God is stressing out here asking for your bread daily. And I think there is an important reason why Jesus chose those words. The next one says, and forgive us our debts. This is an important one. We need to ask for God to forgive us. Ask God to forgive us. Now, there's a significant difference between the way we should view this verse and the way the disciples of Jesus viewed the verse prior to Jesus' crucifixion. The cross is a very important point. Before the cross, we did not live under grace. We lived under law. And I say we, the human beings that lived at that time, lived under law. But after the cross, and all of this was said before the cross, after the cross, we no longer lived under the law, but under grace. But now grace does not put aside the law in the way we often interpret it. But what it does here is that God already forgives us through Jesus Christ. We don't need to do anything for God to forgive us. We now forgive other people, not so that God will forgive us. We forgive other people because we have been forgiven. If you read further in Paul's letters, you see he now asks people to do things like forgive others because God has forgiven us. It is not forgive others so that God will forgive you, but it's forgive others as God has forgiven you. We now ha- follow the example of God. And you might say, well, what if I don't want to forgive? If you are a Christian, the thought of wanting to do something that goes against the will of God is something preposterous. It's something that you cannot even want to think about or entertain to the point where you would like to do it if there was a way out. No. Being brought into the family of God with such a great salvation as the one we have through Christ Jesus, such a great sacrifice, our calling now is to love God with all our hearts, with all our souls, with all our minds, with all our strength, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. That's the new law that we have and we live by. So let's go to the next step. So we need to ask God for forgiveness. As The next step says, as we also have forgiven our debtors. See, this point here is more about asking God to give us the power to forgive others. Ask God to give us the power To forgive others. If you have been severely hurt, and many people have, and I have, 
you will testify that it's very, very difficult. You need God to forgive completely. So we need to pray for God to give us the strength, the power, the ability to completely forgive others. It says next, and do not lead us into temptation. That is a call by Jesus for us to pray for protection. Protection for the evil one because we live in a world that has fallen angels. And the chief of these fallen angels is Satan. And Satan roars around like a lion seeking whom he may devour. And he is looking for people that have the image of Christ. And that is you and me who are Christians. Not only do we live among fallen angels, we live in a fallen world and we live in a fallen body. And all these things pull and, and they fight against the desires of the Holy Spirit in us. So we need to pray for protection from the devil, from protection from even our own flesh. Many of us, we don't need to be rescued from someone else. We need to be rescued from our very own selves. So the next point, but deliver us from evil, talks about a salvation. See, salvation in the scriptures doesn't always refer to salvation that you come to Christ, you're saved from being an unbeliever, but a daily salvation that God saves us from trouble. So we need to pray that when we are faced with the evil one, that God will deliver us from his hands. See, Jesus told Peter at one point that Satan has asked to sieve you like wheat. And I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. When you have been strengthened, turn and strengthen your brothers. Satan is always seeking, asking, wanting to sieve us like wheat. We need to pray for God to keep us from temptation, not to lead us into temptation, to protect us and to deliver us when we are face to face with the devil. The next one, for yours is the kingdom. In this we acknowledge that God owns everything. This is important. We acknowledge that God owns all. This is very crucial. The Bible is clear about it. The, the silver and the gold is mine, says the Lord. The cattle on a thousand hills belongs to the Lord. The Lord is the creator of the whole universe. The hearts of kings are in the hands of the Lord. And like a water course, he turns it whichever way he wants. The Lord raises up kings. He deposes them. The Lord is powerful. The Lord owns everything. He created it all. Why is this important? It is very important to a Christian because when you stand to pray, if you are praying for a need, say a financial need for your food, you know that God is the CEO of the whole universe. You know that Bill Gates, the resources he has, they belong to God. He is a steward. Even though he is an atheist, he is a steward of God. God has put those resources in his hands. Warren Buffett, all of the rich people around the world, Many of them atheists, granted, they still are stewards of God. They are servants of God in that regard. God owns all of the United States. I live in Austin, Texas, a wealthy city. God owns everything in this city. He can give me whatever he wants to give me in this city. He can give you, wherever you are, whatever he wants to give you. Whenever he wants to give you. And he can move heaven and earth to do what pleases him. So remember that. When you remember that God has this kind of authority. That God owns everything. It is easy for you to ask him. And you are not asking. Probably with a subconscious thought. That maybe God is broke. Or God doesn't have enough. You know that God owns everything. So. There is nothing that is too big to ask God or too little to ask Him because He is able to do all. So we should remember, 
for yours is the kingdom. God owns the kingdom. God owns everything. And the power and the glory. This is crucial when we pray because we need to remember that God is omnipotent. Omnipotent. And he has the power to do what we are asking. See, what good is there to ask a God who does not have the power to do what you are asking? Even if he is willing if it's not powerful, then it's no good. But our God is a powerful God and he has the power to do everything that we ask in prayer. This is important. And this is important to think about, to be conscious of as we pray. And Jesus intentionally put this in our prayer, not for us to memorize this, but for us to have these thoughts passing through our mind as we pray and focus on God's greatness. See, when you go to God with a problem, Many times the problem is weighing on us. When you start seeing God's sovereignty and focusing on God's sovereignty, you start focusing on how God owns everything. You start focusing on how God has the power to do everything. You start focusing on those things, how God wants to protect you, how God wants to bring salvation to you in your situation. You start seeing God bigger and bigger and bigger and your problem smaller and smaller and smaller. That is the beginning of an answer to your prayer in what you're going to ask God. So that is important. Then we end with the glory forever and ever. Amen. This shows that God receives all the glory from what He does, that we honor God, we give thanks to God for everything that we do. These are steps that Jesus has given us. We have to give God the glory for everything he does. When, when he does something, we don't share God's glory. God is a jealous God as far as his glory is concerned, loves us with all his heart and is willing to die for us. But you cannot talk about touching God's glory. So we need to give him all the glory and honor God as a father. Honor him. He is willing to, to, to grant us all our requests. So we need to, to honor him and give him thanks. Now let's recap what we have discussed so far. So we have said you, we need to approach God from the point of view of a relationship. Because the relationship with God is how we Receive from him. We need to remember God's sovereignty. That God is holy. That God is set apart. Unique. That there is none like God. We need to remember that even though we are God's children. God is still God. We have not somehow become God's mates. No. God is holy and set apart and unique. And we need to reverence him. We need to, we need to seek and pursue God's purposes in the world. We need to surrender our will, be broken, give up all our self-will and embrace God's will and always pursue it. We need to ask God for our provisions. Remember that we need to actually ask. The Bible says God knows what we need before we ask, but we must ask. It says, ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will be opened. We must ask. Don't go to God and then don't ask and then don't ask what you actually want. You need to ask. Be specific. So we need to also ask God for forgiveness. We need to forgive others. We need to ask God for protection from the enemy. We need to ask God for salvation from the devil. We need to acknowledge that God owns all. And we need to also See God as omnipotent, able to provide everything we need, having the power to accomplish what we are asking. And when he does that, we give him all the power, all the honor and all the glory and all the thanks. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen.